Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 450, featuring part three of my interview with the fabulous Winston Douglas Wood. This part of the interview, we zero in on Fantasy 3. We also talk about Fantasy 4, which wasn't released in the U.S. We'll get into the story behind that game, the, the limb loss system of Fantasy 3, the connections to RuneQuest, and much, much more. A lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is... Mr. Winston Douglas Wood. Let's get into the third fantasy, Fantasy Three: Wrath of Nicodemus, 1987. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd already you already said there's some big changes with this one. You know, mm -hmm. I got a lot of uh, questions from the audience about this one. You know, we've got the you can move your characters around. You've got some differences with the way you can aim uh, spells and things. These different ranks. Uh, Carl Jung wants to know about the limb loss system. So what's mm -hmm. the sort of the story behind that and why, in your opinion, uh, Doug, do mm -hmm. you think so few modern games simulate limb loss and other grievous injuries? <laughs> well, uh, as we were talking about before, the inspiration for that came from RuneQuest. Uh, and it was in RuneQuest, and I guess I got I liked it. Um, it gives it sort of a, a, a morbid uh, Monty Python esque kind. Of, uh, <laughs> uh, You've got no arms left, <laughs> right? Right. It gives it that kind of uh, I don't know if you call it fun, but it, it is sort of fun, you know. Um, but a little grotesque too. Uh, like I said, I, I was just used to it in RuneQuest and thought it added an element to the game. Um, did receive some criticism for being a little too violent. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about that. I can and, imagine some other like positive stuff, though, like people that maybe they are in real life missing an arm, you know, and this would be you know, a powerful way to identify with a character. Yeah, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but it's true. Um, so what kind of pushback did you get? I, Not from I, SSI. I, uh, SSI, they, like I said, they didn't give me a lot of uh, feedback on Fantasy 2 and 3. They were kind of like, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's pretty good. Let's go with it. <laughs> um, except that I, they told me that Fantasy 3 probably should be, uh, you know, a lot of improvements from Fantasy 2. But, it's not like they're very uh, hands-off. It's kind of... Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what you know what what was going on behind the scenes there, but that's that was the, the result was uh, it two and three are pretty much as I designed them, um, and uh, as as far as the uh, the body parts thing in three, I myself I can't I don't know that I would do it again. I really like the strategic placement of characters on on the during combat and being able to protect certain characters or make certain characters more aggressive and that I, I really like that aspect of it. Um, not so sure about the, the, the body parts thing. It's <laughs> pluses and minuses, I guess. You get some angry phone calls from parents <laughs> or letters, I guess. Uh, a couple. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Wow. So one of the things when you were talking about this uh, limb loss system or whatever we want to call it, wound system, mm -hmm. uh, in the RPG Codex interview, you you kind of had a comment, a little aside comment, where you said, well, sometimes adding additional layers of complexity doesn't always in, improve a game. You know, mm -hmm. To me, this is like the key insight, really. It's like as a designer, you sort of have these things you're really you're proud of, you work hard to put this integrate whatever it is into the game and it's just like, you know yes but something's just not working i mean how do you how do you make those decisions well you've really got to uh you, you just got to put something in and, and try it out and see how it works 
to me, the classic example was uh, Sim City, mm-hmm. which was a great game. I loved playing Sim City, and then Sim City 2000 came out, and it was totally, totally not great. This is one time I'm going to say it was not a good game. Um, it had a lot more features, a lot more complexity, and just didn't work. Um, so you you can't know until you try it. You, you got to put the feature in, try it yourself, let your playtesters try it, and see if it's really more fun mm-hmm. uh, or not. And sometimes just chucking rocks is more fun <laughs> than some kind of yeah. complicated ranged weapon oh. ammunition system. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I know a lot of those games back then. You'd see you'd have to eat all the time and worry about water and torches, and it's just a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, does it make it more fun? Maybe, you know, I guess it's, it's it's like something you could put in that would make it more realistic. Right, right. But it's is that going? Does that mean uh, it's going to be more fun? Complex magic systems are another good example. You oh, have yeah. to collect a lot of uh, materials before you can cast a spell, and yeah, that's it's. It's a level of complexity, but it's not a level. It doesn't make it more fun. I know that even within the tabletop games, you'll see. Well, you have to have so much diamond dust to cast it. You know, most of the DMs I play with, they're like, "Ah, forget about that stuff. Yeah. You know? <laughs> We're not going to bother with that." <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like that's a tabletop game, and they're dismissing these mechanics. I mean, can you imagine? Now well, let's get into a uh, Star Command then. You know, this is obviously a big shift uh, from fantasy into uh, SF. You know, uh-huh. I was thinking about some of the other SSI games set in space. You got the you know, whole Buck Rogers. Uh, a couple of those, I think, right? At least at least two of those. I'm not sure what all else they have, but you know, I'm just wondering if you could maybe start just by talking a little bit about the uh, how that game came about and sort of how you, how it fit in or how SSI. I felt it fit in with the rest of their lineup. Um, yeah, so um, I felt like Fantasy 1, 2, and 3 kind of, kind of completed a series, and I could trilogy. go on. Trilogy, yeah. And I could go on to um, Fantasy 4, or I could try something new. And uh, at this, the same time, the uh, IBM PC and compatible market was significantly better and I felt like that would give me enough resources to develop a a sci-fi game uh, the way I would like to so I went ahead and did both at the same time I went to the PC and went to the sci-fi and uh, like I said I really didn't have a lot of game influences it was mostly from my imagination uh, Mm -hmm. uh, from sci-fi that I'd read and whatnot um as to how it should work. But uh, I'm really happy with the way Star Command came out. Um, I think it worked really well, and it has a lot of really cool touches. Um, The complexity of the structures, you know, space stations or buildings or whatever that you explore is, is, uh, I thought, was a big improvement. Um, You said you had Eric helping you with those, right? Yeah, he helped me with those, and... uh, inspired me and uh yeah like i said he designed half of them um and uh, i think it, it it came out real well um but on the other hand we were never able to do a, an apple or commodore 64 conversion of it and the atari st and amiga versions that came out weren't very well done uh by those people who converted them so it was a success on the PC only, and um, it would have been nice if the Commodore 64 market had been uh, addressed. That would have been made a big difference. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the. This must have been late 80s or early 90s when this was going on, right? Um, yeah, late 80s. I think it came out in 88. 88. Which I think that was the same year that the first gold box game. Is that pool of radiance? It, yeah, it sounds about right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is yeah. So the I'm trying to think of the PC because uh, I had Commodore 64. I was one of those with the Commodore 64 and 88. You know, I remember that. Mm-hmm. So I wonder. Yeah, that's that's sort of curious. 
I was going to ask you just in general about all these different ports. You know, notice if you go to YouTube and type in like Fantasy 1 or 2 and, and you can see all the videos and there's a lot of discussion there at the start of each of those videos about uh, what port should you play. <laughs> you know, some people, like you can start it on the Atari ST or the Amiga or some of these other systems, but there's only, I think, one system where you can play all four uh, of the games. Or maybe it's even the three. I'm kind of blanking on the details again, but I know there's only certain platforms where you can play the whole trilogy. Yeah, that's true, and uh, they vary dramatically um, in how well those ports were done. Most of them were pretty good. I was wondering uh, if you have a favorite or suggested one. Or... Uh, I think that the... Or should uh, you stick with the, the ones you did? <laughs> the Amiga and... No, uh, the Amiga and Atari ST versions of... Uh, which the ones that were released of Fantasy uh, 1, 2, and 3 were really good. And if you can play those, that I would recommend that. Um, as far as Star Command, yes, yeah, stick with the PC. The uh, Amiga and Atari weren't so good, and there was never any Commodore 64. But um, it, when you look back at those reviews, we, we talked about different uh, things like the inventory system. Mm -hmm. They were just, they were somewhat different from one computer to the next, so it could have been that the awkwardness someone was complaining about was a uh, had to do more with the with the Commodore port than uh, the design of the system. It's it's possible. Yeah, that, is, that makes you wonder too. Maybe I should, you know, before you embark on your fantasy quest, you know, take a look at these <laughs> different not just the graphics, right? But like you're saying, there could be actual changes in the way you the, the interface, maybe. The, yeah. Yeah, uh, inventory system. How does it feel to to play a port of your own game? Have you ever tried that? <laughs> Sounds like you have. Yeah, um, the the PC version of Fantasy was an interesting one. It was well done. It it, it had slick graphics, but um, it was a little awkward to play. Uh, you had to, had to do a few more steps to to accomplish the same things. Hmm. Uh, so I I would say. I, it might be the easiest one to find, uh, but it's not the best one. Um, it's it's really nice, though, to see when someone has taken your game and improved it a lot, uh, which is you know what happened with the Amiga and Atari uh, Fantasy One. Gorgeous ones. graphics on those versions. Yeah, like. yeah, that was really cool. Hope Eric didn't get his feelings hurt with that. <laughs> <laughs> Did he like the, the ports, too? Yeah, so uh, that does remind me one thing about his feelings being hurt. Um, uh -oh. He, like I said, he designed all the weapons for fan, uh, for Star Command and uh, the stats for them and put a lot of time and effort into it. And then we balanced everything out and with, with extensive testing. And then about three days before it came out, uh, one of the developers at SSI said, I've redone all of the handheld weapons. <laughs> and I guess I should have complained, but I didn't. So redone. They all got renamed. Renamed. They're definitely renamed, but some of the stats were changed too. So uh, he his feelings were hurt about changing those names. Why did they do why why would they do that? I, I don't know. I, I I was kind of uh commenting on the lack of uh uh, of influence they had made on Star Command, and yet they did this one thing right at the last minute, and I wish they hadn't done. Uh, they, 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 I, I would like helpful suggestions in the beginning when it, when we're first developing it, but uh, the last minute suggestion to change all this was uh, not welcome. Yeah, he must have been livid. <laughs> I wanted to, another comment about this game was you had said that. You thought SF or science fiction was a better fit uh, for PC games than the fantasy. You know, I wasn't sure what the context of this was. If you meant like just the PC, it's you know, like the, the DOS or PC gaming community uh, might prefer SF, or if you meant PC in general. You know, I'm just not sure what you meant. <laughs> I guess um, in sci-fi games, there's a lot of technology, right? Um, and you can, so it's, it's natural to depict it on a computer. Um, a lot of similarities between what, you know, the computer, how the computer works and how the 
items that you're using work. You know, they're they're, they're both technology based, whereas fantasy is completely not technology based. Mm-hmm. That that's just a, a sort of vague general observation about the two. That makes sense. I mean, you think about all the all the guys that love building their own PCs and things of that sort. You know, they'd be drawn to games of technology. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking one of the things that came up on the show before and we're talking about Traveler or the uh, uh, System Shock, you know, those sorts of games. Is the You know, in a fantasy game, you, you typically create a level one character. They don't know much. You know, they're off the farm. Or, you know, there mm-hmm. they are with a sword, you know. Uh, yeah. Whereas if you're talking about a science fiction game, especially something set in the future, you know, obviously they would have gone to school, college. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot more that you have to think about in terms of, like, who... Who was this? Who, what was this character doing up until now? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, so yeah, uh, how did you balance all that when you were doing Star Command, or did you think about that a lot? I didn't think about it a lot. Um, yeah, I, I didn't think about it a lot. I, um, like I said, the the character development and all that was. I, I didn't have any basis for it besides uh, besides fantasy games, um, but um, just tried to do stuff that made sense. Um, I think it I think it worked well in terms of gameplay. I don't don't remember anything people complaining about being unrealistic. Um, but yeah, there is a big difference, and when you think about it, well, you got some kudos for making the space battles turn based. And I guess mm-hmm. a lot of the others, just for whatever reason, assume that should be more like an arcade type of game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think the space battles worked out pretty well. Um, and again, I guess turn, turn base is what I was used to. Um, so uh, everyone seemed to like it, and uh, mm-hmm. I we, we went with it. Did you play those gold box, or not gold box, I guess, but the, but the Buck Rogers uh, games? No, the they Sunday. never sent me those. Uh, so <laughs> I'm I surprised they didn't play. try to get you in uh, in on those. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, that was kind of a strange story with the Buck. I guess there's something, somebody had the Buck Rogers license and mm-hmm. almost pressured them into making games based on it. And <laughs> I don't know quite what was going on. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that story. Uh, but it didn't but impact you at all. Nobody came... said, "Well, we're already doing this Buck Rogers thing," so it, yeah, no, yeah, it never came up. Never came up. I had no idea if if they were aware of it when they were talking to me. They never said anything. Well, let's go back to fantasy then and talk about this fantasy four game, uh, mm-hmm. the Birth of Heroes. You know, there seems to be a lot of question marks around around all this. So what what's what what about fantasy four? What you know? How did this come about? And, and oh, well, let's just yeah, start so there. A, after our, 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 um, after Star Command came out, or around the time that it was about to be released, uh, like I said, the Japanese company that had done Fantasy one, two, and three in Japan um, approached SSI, and they said we want to hired Winston Douglas Wood to, <laughs> to design uh-huh. a Fantasy IV, and so can you arrange a meeting? And uh, they did, and that, was, like I said, was the first time I met uh, anyone from SSI. Flew out to Mountain View and uh, went to their office and met some people, and uh, then also met with the Japanese company, and uh, it was a flat, a flat fee kind of thing. I designed it, and... Um, then they programmed it. They did all the testing. They, um, I never got to play it for quite a while after <laughs> it came out, and, and then just wow. briefly. Um, so I don't know how good it was because I, I never got to to kind of balance the game. I guess that was kind of up to them to to balance the playability and the character development and all that. And uh, never heard any complaints about it. But um, it was a little, it was a little tricky. But since I was basing it on Fantasy, you know, three, uh, I had a good starting point, and so I think it probably came out okay. 
So you, you said you've you've gotten to play it since, or at least seen it. I've definitely seen it. Um, I guess no. I guess I never really got to play it. I must have just been seeing YouTube videos of it. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, I uh, maybe read a review or two, and and mm -hmm. there were no complaints about it. I wonder feeling. why they yeah. singled. It must have been something about your series that caught their eye. In the Japanese market? Yeah. You know, I, I, um, yeah, I, I guess they had this, uh, you know, this contract to, to produce fantasy in the Japanese market, and it worked out well for them. Uh, I know they'd had other contracts that didn't work out well, so... So the yes, folks sir. you met with, it was pretty much just all business, or were they big fans of fantasy? Um, it was pretty much all business. Um, and they, they were nice, and it was fun. Um, you said you got to go to Japan at one point, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, my wife is half Japanese, so um, I've been a few times just to visit relatives. But um, after fantasy... Well, actually, the, uh, when Fantasy IV came out, they invited me over. Japanese company did, and um, there. Then we talked about developing another game, which ultimately became Starfire. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was it was great to go over there and, and see their offices and, and meet them and talk to them, and um, especially great because the, we could also meet with uh, my wife's relatives and stuff. So Aladar Kiss, I think I'm pronouncing that right. I hope I am. <laughs> Kiss, <laughs> nice name. Uh, is there any chance for a Western release of Fantasy IV? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, sorry. If I did anything, uh, any sort of uh, you know Android game or whatever, I think it would just be kind of a reboot of the whole series. So it might have some of the elements from Fantasy IV. Um, but yeah, it's not going to be a release of Fantasy IV for sure. I don't really have any electronic uh, access to, to the code, just to the data, anything. Uh, I just presented them a document, uh, and they, I'm sure they made significant changes. And so, yeah, it's just not feasible. Hmm. So in that game, you get to choose parents for your characters. I assume that was your idea. Yeah, so... Um, That's a pretty cool idea. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so the idea was that um, I didn't want you to be able to move your characters from Fantasy Three, but then to some way let those characters live on. Um, and the idea was to let them have children. So oh, uh, nice. So I developed a, a set of rules for you know, which races could have children with which other races. And I honestly don't know how well that went over in the Japanese market, but they kept it that way. Uh, and it's, it gets mentioned a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm hoping it came across as, as a fun thing, kind of the way that the different races uh, came across on Fantasy I. Uh, that was my goal. Uh, to get you attached to your characters a little more and also yeah. just to make it more fun to have these exotic mixed races characters. Yeah, I love the idea of, uh, you know, as a way to, you know, if you're not going to just say, we'll transfer your old characters into the new game, you still want to have some nice connection, right, between the games. And, you know, that, that seems like a really good way to do it. Yeah, yeah. I wish as, uh, I'd been able to do it more often, but... Uh, yeah, it was kind of an interesting idea, and I, as far as I can tell, it went over fairly well. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking with some of the with the earlier fantasy games, you, you could import characters from one game to the next, right? There were various limitations yeah. on that. Or... Uh, you could, and I can't remember what happened, but it wasn't like you could import a really high level character and then just have Stop a high level the character. Game, yeah. I don't know if they lost their levels. 
I, th- I think that that might have been it. They lost their levels, um, but there were certainly some limitations on it. And uh, maybe I just thought with Fantasy Four to make a a different way of preserving your characters. It is one of those things. I guess every well, if you're successful as a designer, you know, if you want to make a sequel, you have to think about this. Well, you're going to let people bring in the old characters, and what if you, what if they're basically gods? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> to cook up some uh, story about why they lost their weapons and amnesia or whatever, but then it's like, why are you even bothering? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I I did that with Fantasy Three. It was somehow you know took away their most of their levels somehow, I, and I don't remember how I justified it, but uh, figured I probably couldn't pull it off again, so. <laughs> I like the the parents' idea, though. I think it's definitely a keeper. Yeah. That's a keeper. Uh-huh. Uh, so you mentioned this game already a couple of times, Starfire. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of tw- I had a couple of tweets that were just like one word, Starfire. <laughs> so yeah. a lot of people want to hear about this. <laughs> Man, that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, should be back. We'll talk a little bit about when uh, in a minute, but we've got at least one more installment. Actually, I can say for sure there's one more installment with uh, Mr. Winston Douglas Wood. Uh, and then we'll get into a new interview series that's coming up uh, actually on Monday. I'll be interviewing Mr. Brian Hines of Obsidian. Uh, he's done The Outer Worlds, Tyranny, uh, South Park, Stick of Truth, and much, much more. That's going to be a fantastic interview, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much for supporting this show, for supporting Matchat all these years. My God, can you believe it? I'm already up to 450. Uh, if you want to do your part to support the show, I know times are tough right now, so if you are unemployed or what, uh, you know, or not in good health, forget about it. But you know, if you're doing okay, please uh, head over to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. I'm actually, uh, what I was talking about before, I'm just, just kind of almost like a, a centimeter, <laughs> mere inches away from my uh, stretch goal to get to the back to the uh, three episodes per month. That's what I was saying. You know, we'll talk about how long the next episode will be. Uh, I mean, just a tiny little sliver there. Uh, so if you're one of those folks that, you know, after I made that transition to monthly, a lot of folks were signed up for the Bucka Show. Uh, well, those uh, all got converted into a buck a month, or 25 cents basically per episode uh, for those. So, you know, if you're doing okay financially, please head over there. If you're one of those uh, ratlings, uh, upgrade to the Ratron level. It's not that, it's basically the same amount as before the shift uh, to monthly. Uh, and then we'll get to that uh, stretch goal pretty quickly. Uh, so thank you for that. And again, if you're not in a position to do that right now, I understand. Please don't worry about it. Uh, I just appreciate your support in whatever form it may take. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, let's see, what about that news from the Mac Cave? All right, I've already kind of blurted uh, out my news that I'll be interviewing Brian Hines, so we'll skip that. Uh, next up, we have this game called Mini Prince. Uh, this is by Ann Braz. Not quite sure how to pronounce this gentleman's name. <laughs> a friend of mine on uh, Facebook, though. Got an epic collection of museum. Pretty, pretty interesting guy. Um, anyway, uh, he has created this game, Mini Prince. It's a uh, homage, I guess, to the classic platformer game Prince of Persia, an Apple II classic. It's getting a one-level makeover into a full ASCII experience, thanks to Anne. Uh, yes, indeed. Thanks to a heads up from this developer, we've been told the upcoming game will be a cute fan fa- fan-made fantasy platform for MS-DOS systems as it's completely stripped down to its bare minimum and thrown into a shrinking device version. As I'm pretty sure, I was reading his blog about this. I think he might have done this in QBasic. Uh, not quite sure. You can read about that, though. I'll post a link in the show notes. But uh, Anyway, congratulations. This looks like a lot of fun. Mini prints. Definitely want to uh, play this. And there's even a little box, a mini box version you can buy <laughs> if you're uh, looking for some physical uh, collectibles. Uh, so anyway, I just think this is a lot of fun. Uh, it's a fun project, so I want to share it with you. Uh, next up, we have old Wild Bill Steely. Now, if you've read my book, uh, Vintage Games 2.0, right there, 
Uh, you know about him and Microprose, and this is a company, they did a lot of, uh, I think they started off mostly doing combat flight sims, and then of course they had uh, somebody on their uh, roster named Sid Meyer, that's where he got his, uh, and that was the company he broke out from, I guess, and of course they went on to do much more than the flight sims. Uh, but anyway, this Wild Bill Steely was one of those, uh, you know, he's like a real-life pilot, if I recall correctly. <laughs> I probably should know that, <laughs> uh, having written that chapter about him. Uh, but anyway, he is back at it. He's trying to help resurrect this Microprose brand. It's kind of fallen into obscurity, sadly. Uh, but they're back on Steam. They've got some new games coming out. There's uh, one called Sea Power, a naval combat sim. There's Second Front a World War II tactics battler, and Task Force Admiral, a carrier task force sim. So I was, uh, I really, I'm going to link to an article about, you know, Wild Bill and, and the new Microprose. I think it's pretty fun. There's a lot of nostalgia there. You know, they were talking about how a lot of us uh, growing up, our dads actually would be playing these uh, Microprose games on their uh, Commodores or whatever. We were just kids, basically too young to, uh, to play those games or too complex. Uh, but we still have those, uh, you know, fond memories of it. So, you know, now it's kind of our turn if Microprose, uh, Microprose is able to, uh, you know, make this comeback. So definitely stay tuned. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if you remember a game called Shadow of the Beast, uh, this is just, for, to me, it's just, every time I think about the Amiga, I think about Shadow of the Beast and Psygnosis and all their uh, really classic platforming and shoot 'em up games. I mean, just beautiful art and music, uh, you know, it's just phenomenal stuff. Uh, but anyway, this is called Legacy of the Beast. It's an unofficial D-make. D-make? D-E-make. <laughs> of the Amiga Classic Shadow of the Beast, developed by Reflections and published in, originally in 1989. Uh, written in 6502 Assembly, it is an Atari 2600 conversion intended to be as faithful to the original as technically possible given the capabilities of a system released in 1977. Uh, so they've taken this classical Mega game and demade it, uh, whatever that means, for the Atari 2600's pretty cool programming feat. Uh, they say it will run on an Atari 2600 compatible emulator, uh, Stella go over 2000 open, open MEU. Uh, but the cool thing is it will actually run on a physical Atari NTSC system. So that is pretty, pretty fun. I want to share that with you. Uh, Legacy of the Beast. All right, I think that will do it for the news. Uh, so I was looking for good quotes. And I don't know if you have heard this yet. Probably, be, uh, probably have heard. Uh, the Little Richard has passed on. Uh, of course, iconic rock and roll legend. So I was kind of curious. You know, I wonder if he left any good quotes behind and, you know, of course, he's uh, got a lot of them. Uh, but I just thought this one was really clever. It's kind of funny, too. And so I thought I'd share this with you. It goes something like this. I like to give my love to everybody and let them know that the grass may look greener on the other side, but believe me, it's just as hard to cut. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> anyway, I hope you uh, folks enjoyed that, and see you next time. Place your trust in me, and I promise you all things will be possible.